I'm going to preach a message tonight on uh, scriptures that prove a pre-trib rapture in the book of Romans. Uh, this famous thing among post-tribbers is they'll say, you don't have one scripture to prove a pre-trib rapture. Well, actually, there are the Pauline epistles that are written to Christians. Uh, there's rapture passages all through it. And I'm going to be doing a series of studies going through each of the Pauline epistles, showing verses that point to the rapture happening before the time of Jacob's trouble. And I will use the term pre-trib rapture simply because it's the commonly accepted uh, phrase that's that's been people have come up with. But I want to start out this little study just uh, offering an apology to the post-tribbers out there. Um, I really do feel that I need to sincerely apologize to all the post-trib people because of something I've been doing for years and years and years. You say, what's that? Well, I've been taking it way too easy on post-tribbers. Um, there's going to be some attitude in this study because the Lord opened up my eyes in this thing and showed me the importance of the rapture. It's incredible how it lines up with Scripture and something very, very, very important. Um, this, this was a tremendous study for me um, to just go through the, the Bible and have the Lord open my eyes to this thing. It's incredible. Uh, the rapture happening before the time of Jacob's trouble is major, major doctrine. In fact, it pertains to salvation. So all you post-tribbers out there, all you post-trib heretics that have for years and years and years been saying, it's, not, it's a non-issue, it's not important, it's not important, you're lying. That's not the Holy Spirit speaking through you. And, I, and I, I'll say this too, and that is a lot of times I have been way too soft on people because I'm very conscious that I am speaking to lost people many times and both saved and lost a lot of times, and I'm trying to be gentle and things like that. And a lot of people have taken advantage of that, uh, my meekness. And they get me sidetracked. Um, that's not going to happen much anymore. Uh, the hour is very, very late, prophetically speaking. And uh, it's time to take the gloves off, to be quite frank. Um, the body of Christ is going to be leaving, and I don't know how long it's going to be. But it will be before the time of Jacob's trouble. And I'm going to prove that in this study tonight. And I realize that the post-tribber, post the people, and, and you know, if you're newly saved and you are falling for some of this post-trib stuff, this, the nasty, mean things I'm going to say in this study, uh, the sarcasm that I'm going to be using, it's not directed at you. Okay, What I'm talking about are those people who will no more be admonished, the ones that don't care about the truth. Uh, those are the ones I'm going to be attacking very harshly in this study because I'm going to show you some very clear scriptures in the book of Romans. Then, whether next week or the week after, I'm not sure yet, we'll be on through 1 Corinthians, and then 2 Corinthians, and on through. And I'm going to show you there are multiple places where Paul is referring to the completion of what we have as Christians, which is the rapture. And I talked about this in my study on dispensations, the seven different dispensations. Each one has to end with a major event. They always do. Consistent the whole way from Genesis to Revelation. Every dispensation ends with a major event. And where we are at currently right now, what many call the church age, ends with the rapture. I'm going to be proving it in this study and showing you some things that the Lord really showed me. Oh, this is going to be a good study. Now, having said that as an introduction, uh, I realize the post trippers probably most of them are already turned the thing off and they're writing their little comment before they go to do whatever else they're going to do. Typical of them. And uh, by the way, if you're if you're saved and uh, you know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and um, and I'm not the Holy Spirit, but you know what I'm saying, the Holy Spirit bears witness to the truth and you know that the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, that's the real, you know, term for it. You know that it's true. Uh, lift up your voice like a trumpet and spare not. Show the post tribbers their sin. <laughs> okay, um, let them have it. Okay, don't uh, no no profanity, no nothing like that. You don't you know, don't resort to that. You're not supposed to do that as a Christian. But uh, it's time that we start calling heretics heretics. And uh, you know, get off my channel if you're a post trib heretic. And they, you know, it amazes me that some of these post tribbers, I kick them off, I block them from my channel, and they get back in somehow. 
But let's start out here. I'm going to talk about seven unique characteristics of the rapture. The rapture is Bible doctrine. The Holy Spirit will show you that if you're saved. If you're lost, well, then you, that's why you can't see it. A lot of these post trippers we're not going to go through, you know, we're going to go through the tribulation. Well, you probably will. Okay? But those of us that are actually saved, that are born again, we're not going through it. We're not going to go through that time of Jacob's trouble. Wrongly called the tribulation. But the seven unique characteristics of the rapture, that it pertains to this event and not to the second coming. Number one, dead and living saints are caught up together in the clouds. Now, there is not one mention of that in any of the gospel accounts where dead and living saints are going up as far as in connection to Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and 21. But there is one in John, which we'll be looking at here in a little bit. Number two, the second unique characteristic of the rapture. It is the fulfillment of the body of Christ and our salvation. Yes, it does pertain to salvation. I'm going to prove it. Okay? Number three, the revelation of God's wrath begins with the Antichrist, which happens after Christians are gone. Again, proven, proven fact. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. All right? The he who now letteth is the Holy Spirit. He is hindering the Antichrist until he, the body of Christ, not the Holy Spirit, because that's where these little post-tribber heretics will come in. They'll say, well, the, the, you know, until he be taken out of the way thing there, that's the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not possible because, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to be here and he's omnipresent, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know. I know that. He is hindering, but the he that is removed is the body of Christ. Again, I'm going to prove it in this study. Um, number four, Christians receive an incorruptible body. All right. That happens at the rapture, not at the second coming. Number five, Christians receive the mind of Christ. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the charity chapter. That happens at the rapture. You know. Um, number six, Christians are judged and rewarded with crowns and millennial reign, the judgment seat of Christ. Right? And, and again, I've covered this in other studies. I'm not going to cover each one of these points. Number seven, Christians get married to Jesus Christ. Revelation 19. And prepare to return to the earth for the battle of Armageddon. And it's been so well said, these post trib heretics, you know, well, Christians, the body of Christ goes through the whole thing. Then who is it up in heaven that's getting married to the Lamb before he comes back the second time? You see, the system is not, the Holy Spirit's not going to make up a system as stupid as post trib or post trib pre wrath or mid trib, all these other nonsensical. Catholic teachings. And it, they are Catholic, by the way. Okay? Whenever you get the church has to do extra suffering to add on to what Christ already did, what Christ already accomplished, you're dealing with Catholicism. Catholicism says, yes, we do believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for sins, but you have to also take the Mass. You have to die in a state of grace. You make sure that you keep the sacraments. Make sure you faithfully attend your local church. Mm -hmm. You see? But let's get into it. Romans chapter 1. Keep these things in mind that we went over there, the seven points. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. Okay, it says here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, it came to the Jew first. If you're Jewish, you need to think about that. The New Testament is not an anti-Semitic book. The people who twist it to go against the Jews, they're the ones that are anti-Semitic. I'll give you a little hint. The Catholics. Okay? To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You say, what's the point of that? Okay, what's the point? Are they living 100% by faith in the time of Jacob's trouble? No. Oh, heresy, heresy. Okay, shut up, stupid post-tribbers, just for a minute. Open your mind a little bit, and maybe you can learn something. Okay? Okay. 
In the time of Jacob's trouble, the book of Revelation is coming to pass. It's sight. Yes, they're still going to have to live by faith. They're still going to have to believe in Jesus and things like that. But it's keeping the commandments and the faith of Jesus. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Deal with the scriptures. I know that's hard for you to do, post-trib heretics, but you need to deal with the scriptures. And if you don't rightly divide the word of truth as you're commanded to do in 2 Timothy 2.15, then you will be a workman that needs to be ashamed. God is ashamed of you. They do not live completely, 100% by faith. They have sight also. Verse 18, Romans 1, 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Keep your hand right there in Romans chapter 1. We're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, And with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in in unrighteousness. Romans chapter 1, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Comparing scripture with scripture. Romans chapter 1 is a direct tie-in right there, verse 18, direct tie-in to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. No passages in the New Testament, you know, in the, in the Pauline epistles or anything, no, no verses prove a pre-trib rapture. Yes, they do. You say, how does that prove a pre-trib rapture? Is God going to send strong delusion on Christians that are messing around? Carnal Christians? There are those out there. There are many Christians that oftentimes receive not the love of the truth. Hold the pleasure in unrighteousness. And I realize it says there, receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved understand that. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And again, what do you do with the mark of the beast? I'm told in Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 4 that I'm eternally secure, that I am sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. But if I go into the time of Jacob's trouble and I slip up and take the mark and worship the beast, Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11 says, I get God's wrath. How does that work? You see, what's really behind the post-trib movement is a desire to make God a liar. Because if God becomes a liar, he can't be God. Somebody else would have to take over. I wonder who that would be. Hmm. Next, go to Romans chapter 8. There are some good ones in this study, believe me. It's some good stuff. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 25. We're going to read a bunch of verses here. Okay, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Sons of God in your Old Testament is always a reference to angels. Every single time, read the book of Job. Sons of God in the New Testament, still a reference to angels, but it's also a reference to redeemed saints. Jesus says, in the resurrection, they are as the angels of God. Yeah, you will be a son of God in eternity. Verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. But what are you going to do if you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble? You mean to tell me you can watch InfoWars or all these other conspiracy things about the New World Order and not get a spirit of fear? How about that? 
So when you get that spirit of fear, it's not coming from God. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso trusteth in the Lord shall be safe. Hmm. We are the children of God, according to verse 15. Right there. Why would God put his own children into the time of his wrath and his judgment? Huh? Doesn't make much sense. Verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. See, Christians go through the time of Jacob. Oh, excuse me. The great tribulation. I'll sound like a real good post-tribber, you know. I can play along with it because I've dealt with their idiocy for years and years and years. Uh, that's not what it's talking about. Well, Christians have it easy here in America. American Christians don't know what it's like to suffer. Oh, I beg to differ. I beg to differ very, very much. You see, false Christians, they don't suffer. The false Christians are the ones that get along with the world, the ones that their family members love them and their co-workers love them and everything else. They're good people. Uh-huh. But real, true, Bible-believing Christians, you know what it's like to suffer. Some of you ladies out there, your husbands are lost and give you a hard time. Your children make fun of you. Do you know about suffering? Some of you Christians out there, you've had accidents, you've had problems and things like that. You're in wheelchairs, you're sick, you have headaches, you have all kinds of stuff. You know what it's like to suffer? Hey, you say, but, but what about the Christians back in the past that were dying as martyrs? Uh, let's see. Those Christians never knew what an EMF field was. Electromagnetic frequency, if you don't know. We live in that electrical smog all the time, depressing us, just constantly just being bombarded by it. Christians back there in the Dark Ages didn't walk in and to go to the markets and things to get their food and hear heavy metal rock music being played over the loudspeakers. Go to the gas station to get gas and it's playing there. And everywhere you go, rock music, rock music, rock music now. Vexation. People back there in the dark ages when the people were being martyred and things like that, they didn't know what GMO crops were. They didn't know about geoengineering in the skies. They didn't know about all this other stuff that just vexes you if you're a Christian. And we have to live in this polluted planet and still maintain our faith in Jesus Christ. Still walk with the Lord. Everywhere you go, vexation, vexation. You hear people, profanity, just just a disgusting world that we live in. But we don't know what it's like to suffer, huh? Nonsense. How many people back in the 1500s do you think even knew what pornography was? And yet, it's used as advertisement for regular things today. You go to check out at the grocery store and there's filth magazines all over, you know, beside you and stuff. Well, I'll go to the family friendly aisle. You see that and stuff. It's still there. You know, it might not be as vexing as some of the other garbage, but it's still there. Oh, but we don't suffer. You might not if you're a post-tribber, but those that are truly saved, we do suffer. And we can really look forward to going and being with Jesus Christ and to getting out of this sinful world and this sinful body. But I guess your sins don't bother you, especially if you're one of the Jack Hiles, Stephen Anderson, you know, all these easy believism people. No repentance associated with your salvation. Uh, yeah. Just belief. Sure. But a little encouragement here. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen. Again, if you're newly saved, go back into the end part of the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and on back through, and look at what we have coming for all of eternity. It's going to be amazing. All right, uh, what you're going through, and I know that some of you, you know, I, I hear from you and things, and I, I wish I could respond to everybody, but it's just, <laughs> it's not going to happen. I can't. How do you respond to thousands of people? I, I'm one man. I can't do it. But I know, I, I know you're suffering. I know that you go through some really hard times. Some of you feel really, really, really alone. Wouldn't you like to be caught up tonight and go and you be with all the brothers and sisters in Christ that have been for the last 2,000 years, approximately? Wouldn't that be great? And then see Jesus Christ? It's a blessed hope. But let's continue reading. 
Look at this, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Hmm. Verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, right now, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they out there in the world, but ourselves also. Even as a Christian, it's vexing. Even as a Christian, we go through the same things as the lost world. We're dying, they're dying. We're in corruption. Second law of thermodynamics, if you want to get all scientific about it, you know. Verse 23, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Get back to that in a minute. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. The just shall live by faith. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for the Antichrist. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I read the verse wrong. We with patience wait for the new world order. Oh, I read it wrong again. We wait for it. What is it? The hope, the blessed hope of being caught up to Jesus Christ. But look at verse 23. The redemption of our body. Turn over to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 10. That in the dispensation, oh no, terrible word there, dispensation, look out, post tribbers are falling on the ground, foaming and frosting at the mouth, you know, dispensation, oh no. Yeah, it's a Bible word, stinking heretics. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one. All things in Christ, both which are in heaven, the dead, and which are on earth, the living, even in him. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, what was that again? You hear the word of truth? People reject the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Those that are lost. See the tie-in? In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. True for somebody right now, not true for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. And not one post-tribber can answer that. All they'll do is they'll say, well, if you're truly saved, you wouldn't take the mark. Sure, sure. Christians take things all the time that are required by the government. More on that later. Christians would take the mark? Give me a break. Of course they would. And then it would cause God to be a liar because you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Look at verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption. What did we just read over in Romans chapter 8? Redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. I'm going to tell you something, Christian. Not one of you out there is 100% saved. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. What, what did you just say? I said not one of you is 100% saved. You know what else? I'm not 100% saved. Huh? Huh? You have three parts to you. You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. Soul and spirit are saved. The body's not. But it will be. 
You know, wherever D.L. Moody is buried, I could go over there and I could dig up his body and I'd find some pieces probably left. Bones, you know, because he died in 1899. But the point is, Christian man di died back then. You know why? Body's corruptible. Body hasn't been redeemed yet. His, his salvation is not 100% complete. He's in heaven with the Lord, but his salvation isn't co totally complete yet. The redemption of the purchased possession has not yet happened. Go back to Romans chapter 8. We're going to see some more of this as we continue here. Romans chapter 8. Verse 23. It says there, let's just look at this again. Waiting, down at the end there, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You see, one of the other big things that's going to happen when the rapture occurs is all the debate over who's really saved, who's not saved, and whatever else, it's over. When the rapture happens, it's God that makes the decision. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God tries the hearts. And it's at that point in time, you aren't going to fake God. You can get on YouTube and you can make little videos holding up a King James Bible and say, I believe the King James Bible. But in the end, God's going to judge your heart. And there's going to be some King James only people that are left behind because they weren't genuinely saved. There was no changed life like the Bible requires. And I'm going to start calling out some heretics in the future that are coming out and preaching this satanic, false gospel of easy believism. Again, I've been way too gentle with these heretics. It's disgusting. Jump down to verse 35 in Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or uh, nakedness, or peril, or sword. Well, if the body of Christ goes into the uh, tribulation, you know, into the time of Jacob's trouble, as it's properly called, if, the, if Christians would go in there, you could be separated from the love of Christ. What are you going to do with that? I believe that the whole Bible teaches the same gospel. You're a fool. You say, what did you say? I said, you are a fool. F-O-O-L. Fool. Well, doesn't the Bible say, call no man a fool? Yeah, without a cause. But I have a cause. The whole Bible does not teach the same thing. That's heresy. Again, heresy. And I'm not saying, throwing around the word heresy lightly, and oh, let's burn the heretics or something. I'm not a Catholic, okay? I'm not saying that. Heresy can be corrected. Straighten out by the word of God. And if you've been led to believe heresy, you better repent. And that doesn't mean change from unbelief to belief. That means change your direction. Get out of that system that you're in. And come to God and ask for his forgiveness for being stupid. Oh, it's so offensive. Oh, the comments are going to be... I just, I agree with what you're doing, but I just don't think you should be so offensive. I don't care about your feelings. All right? There's no more time for that. People's faith is being destroyed. False prophets are preaching false gospels, leading people to hell, saying, pray a prayer or just believe if you're Fenninger, Ed Fenninger, just if you feel, feel that you're a Christian, you believe the basics of the gospel, there's no changed life, there's no nothing. I'm not going to stand idly by and let people go to hell like you are doing if you're offended by my speech. You know, I'm offended by you, Brian. You're, you're too harsh. You're too critical. You have too much of an attitude. Go somewhere else. I don't need to put up with you anymore. You know, again, out of the goodness of my heart, I try to get into the comments and try to help people and things like that. And all I get is a bunch of stinking people arguing with me. And I thank God for those of you out there that do see the truth and are saying, okay, hey, I might not agree with you in this or that, but hey, I'll, I'll stand with you here and there and whatever else, and I'm not going to keep harassing you. 
But you little nitpicky people that make fun of me, make fun of my wife, and probably there will be people who make fun of my son now, too, I imagine. You know, and God's going to judge you if you do that. Go somewhere else. Get off my channel. I don't have time for you. This channel's for people that want to get saved and want to do something for the Lord before we're caught out of here. Verse 36, as it, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now look at this. You want a, another pre-trib rapture passage? Here we go. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not true if you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. If the Pauline epistles are written for somebody that goes into the time of Jacob's trouble, then Paul just lied to you. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You see what post-tribbers are doing? They're making God into a liar. That's why I'm fired up. That's why I'm ticked off. I'm sick and tired of putting up with this. If a Christian goes into the time of Jacob's trouble, anything in verse 38 and 39 can separate you from the love of God. You take that mark, you go to hell. You cannot reconcile the Pauline epistles with what goes on in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not written to the same group. And if you're teaching it, you are setting people up to die and go to hell for eternity. May the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke all of you post-tribbers out there. It's disgusting. Romans 9.27 And if you're one of my brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you. Okay? I'm not mad. I'm having fun. I love to be able to preach the word and to see that the Bible is crystal clear. I'm glad for the fact that I have a blessed hope that I'm going to be leaving this rotten, cruel, disgusting planet soon. Praise God. And I'm going to be able to meet all my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, and we're going to throw us a party the likes of which this universe has never seen when we get to be with Jesus Christ, our Savior. No more little mealy-mouthed little, oh, what about this, what about this, what about that? Uh-huh, yeah, none of that. They're down on the earth. We're up in the clouds throwing a party. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Romans 9.27 Some more preacher rapture verses for you. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the, though the number of, them, of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. What's it referring to? 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And there's probably going to be some more than that, but uh, not a whole lot. Most of the Jews are going to get slaughtered. And hey, again, if you're Jewish and you're watching this, do you think you have, really are going to have a chance in that time? Why don't you get out now while it's easy? Oh, but my family is going to come against me and I, you know, my rabbi is going to be mad at me and things like that. Oh, poor thing. What do you think is going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble? Huh? Your head's going to get cut off. You're going to be an enemy of the new world order. They're going to hunt you down like an animal. And that's easier to go through. You'll see the signs. I know the Bible says Jews require a sign, but uh, why don't you break the rule a little bit there and say, you know what? I think I'm going to get out now. I think I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ and accept Him as my Messiah. Study the New Testament on my own, you know, apart from my rabbi that hates Jesus. Tries to turn me away from Jesus. You better wake up. Verse 28, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Hmm. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Paul is writing about this future time when God's going to take a remnant of Israel and save them. We're going to see that in just a little bit here. What about this thing of uh, cutting it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. 
Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It does not say, then shall be the great tribulation. It says, then shall be great tribulation. Again, it's a description. It is never used as a title. All post-tribbers will put that on you and try to tie it in with things in the Pauline epistles where you have tribulation and things. Again, that's why I expose this thing over and over and over again. Get it drilled into your head. Look at verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Who are the elect? The Christian church that took over Israel, that replaced Israel. Yes, okay, thank you, Vatican Catholic that believes in replacement theology. No, Bible believers understand who the elect is there in Matthew chapter 24. It's a reference to what goes on there in verse 27, in the book of Romans, Romans 9, 27, it's Israel, the Jews, the Jews that reject Jesus Christ right now, the Lord has future plans for them. Look at verse 29, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and had been like unto Gomorrah. Another interesting verse. You say, why is that? Turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11 and verse 8. The two witnesses that come back, Moses and Elijah. And I have a whole video on that if you have questions. <coughs> It says here, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. What is Paul referring to here in Romans chapter 9? He's giving a little bit of a shout out, if you will, to what's going on in the time of Jacob's trouble. There back in Romans chapter 9 verse 29, had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been like made like unto Gomorrah. In the time of Jacob's trouble, Jerusalem is called Sodom in Egypt. I thought that was very interesting. Now we're going to go to the infamous Romans chapter 11. I say infamous because the post-tribbers, when you go post-trib, it's inevitable you have to become race, replacement theology. You have to eliminate the Jews from Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, 21. You know, 17 and 21, I should say it that way. You have to push the Jews out of the picture. It cannot be the time of Jacob's trouble. You have to push that off. Maybe like uh, Roland Rasputin, you put it at the very end. Just give them a little blip, little time there where God deals with the nation of Israel. But it's mostly for the purification of Christ's church. Straight out of the Catholic Catechism. Romans chapter 11, verse 1 through 15. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. Uh, how do you say that the church has replaced Israel? doesn't make any sense. Paul is clearly making a distinction here between, you know, about people that are Jews according to the flesh. <clears throat> Verse 4, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is, uh, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Okay, what Paul is saying there is he's basically saying, okay, there are Jews that are saved right now. Even at this present time, God has preserved a remnant of those Jews. They're not going to get wiped out at any point in time. And especially into the time of Jacob's trouble. God has plans for him. Verse 7, What then? 
Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. We'll continue here. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. I say then, Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to them emulation them which are my spirit. Uh, no, actually it says flesh. Okay? Paul speaking about Jews. And might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Understand something. And again, maybe I haven't made this very clear in some of my other studies. I do support the nation of Israel. But that doesn't mean that I agree with them. That doesn't mean that I respect your beliefs. I don't respect your beliefs if you reject Jesus Christ. I have no respect for your beliefs. You're on your way to hell. Jesus is the Messiah for the Jewish people. If you've rejected him, you've rejected God manifest in the flesh. And there are plenty of prophecies. I did a whole study on that. It can only be God manifest in the flesh. A young, a, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, as it says back in the Old Testament. All right? Only God could do that. It's not a young woman like the Catholic Vatican versions will do. All right? God was manifest in the flesh. He is your Savior. And if you reject Him and you die in your sins, you go to hell. It's as simple as that. And don't think, well, in the time of Jacob's trouble, I'll be able to get saved through my good works and the temple will be re rebuilt and all this other stuff. you still got to come to Jesus. And when Moses and Elijah show up, they're going to be preaching Jesus. Okay? Very important to understand that. But you say, what does this have to do with the timing of the rapture? This doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's think about this for a minute. What Paul is writing about here, he's saying, hey, there's going to come a time when God is provoking the Jews to jealousy and their fullness is going to come in when God starts to deal with the nation of Israel again. Now, if Christians go through the time of Jacob's trouble, if we're just going to be there and it's going to be a time for purification for the church, when's the fullness of the Jews? When does that time come in? When does God start to deal with, specifically with the nation of Israel? doesn't make much sense. No, the body of Christ leaves before God starts to deal with the nation of Israel again. If you were saved, you'd understand that. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. That's a future event. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. And again, that's not anti-Jewish, that's not anti-Semitic or something. As concerning the gospel, we are enemies. But as touching the election, you're beloved for the Father's sake. Again, how does this work out if the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble? Why is there a distinction when the distinction is clearly done away with in Galatians, the book of Galatians? There's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. Then why is Paul making a distinction? How about that? Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> Now remember, there are not any scriptures in the entire New Testament that prove a pre-trib rapture. Everything is just all, you know, for Christians and they go into the time and all. Keep that in mind as we read these verses. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now is that going to be true in the time of Jacob's trouble? Yes. 
Absolutely. Jesus Christ is the one that unleashes the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. He's ordained of God, isn't he? Yeah. Why? To pour out God's wrath, God's judgment. Don't give me this thing that the wrath starts halfway through and not before that. That is nonsense. Absolute, total nonsense. Jesus Christ unleashing the Antichrist and he brings war and, you know, death, and famine and, you know, or famine and then death and hell. That's not God's wrath. I mean, give me a break. These post-tribbers are so desperate to, to uh, deceive people. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Wait a second here, Paul. Wait a second. In Revelation, it says, if you take the mark, you go to hell. But you're saying, if we resist the power, we receive damnation. How does that work? In Revelation, you're told, don't listen to the appointed ruler, the Antichrist, the one that Jesus Christ opens the seal when he goes out. Don't listen to him. Paul says, do listen to the God-appointed ruler. And if you don't, you'll receive to yourself damnation. How do you reconcile that? You just kind of uh, ignore that as a post-tribber. Look at verse 3 and think about the Antichrist system that's coming and tell me that this is for people, saints, the church goes through it. Tell me about it. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Sure, that's Reference to the Antichrist. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God. The Antichrist? Uh, no. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. You're supposed to honor the Antichrist according to the non-dispensational post tribbers you say, well, they don't teach. Hey, man, if Romans is for us today and it's all there and there's no dispensational change, then Romans would be for us as we're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. So when you see the Antichrist show up, you say, hey, everybody, we got to honor him. He's God's appointed man. Let's submit to do whatever he tells us to do. You see? Post-tribbers are heretics. They're false prophets. The great falling away is being led down by two groups, post-tribbers and easy-believism easy heretics, the ones that preach against repentance and a changed life. They're leading the apostasy right into the ground right now. They're saying, you can't repent. There's no repentance of sin involved with your salvation. There's no changed life. And Christians go through the time of Jacob's trouble. I wish that the pre-trib rapture was the truth, but it's not. It's a lie. And more and more people are going against it now. Uh-huh. Sure. Sure. Not those of us that have some sense and know the Lord. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. Another good one. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep... Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 sometime. It's interesting, the comparison between those that are awake and those that are sleeping. But check this out. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Wait a second here. Wait a second. This doesn't make sense. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed? I thought I was saved. I thought it's salvation, the point of when you, when you ask the Lord to save you and He saves you, isn't that salvation? That's two-thirds of your salvation, brethren. Soul. Your soul is made alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins before. Your soul is 
made alive. Your spirit is quickened. You can read about that in Ephesians chapter 1, or no, Ephesians chapter 2, I think it is. It's in Ephesians. Your soul, your spirit, but your body is still corruptible. Read about that earlier. Your flesh is still corruptible. But guess what? When you get saved, your full, complete salvation, the redemption of the purchased possession, the changing of your vile body, your body of sin that's prone to sin, prone to thinking evil thoughts and things like that. That salvation that we all long for, we groan for it sometimes. No more backache, no more headache, no more sickness, no more cold, no more failing eyesight, no more sore knees. No more tiredness. No more, all these things. No more desire for sin. Our salvation, that salvation is nearer than when you first believed. You get saved during this sermon. And by the end of the sermon, by the end of an hour from there, your salvation is nearer than when you believed. No scriptures for a pre-tribulation rapture. There's another one. There's another one. You say, well, that could be somebody that goes through the, the tribulation or time of Jacob's trouble, whatever you want to call it. Uh, no, it can't because they have no guarantee at salvation. Anytime you slip up and take the mark and worship the beast, you're done. You're cut off. God lies to you and says, hey, I'm sorry. You say, well, wasn't I sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? Oh, that. Well, yeah, but you took the mark. I, I'm sorry. I can't. Either that or else he'll lie to the devil and just say, well, yeah, you know, I got to let him have the mark anyhow. The devil's going, but doesn't your word say in Revelation 14, 9 through 11 that anybody that takes a mark goes to hell? Doesn't it say that? Well, yeah, but I kind of promised him with the Holy Spirit. What am I supposed to do? This is a bad situation. I'm... You see? It's absurd. Verse 12. The night is far spent. Amen. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. Again, compare it to 1, Corinthians, or, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. You know, I get sick and tired of the strife after a while. All the time, all the time. I just try to get videos out, you know, try to preach the gospel and whatever else, and I get these people in the comments. You preach the Lord's of salvation, you're a heretic. Uh-huh, yeah, sure. Gets old after a while. Verse 14, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Mm -hmm. You're still in a body that's corruptible. You say, well, wait a second, I thought you said that there's a changed life. There's a change required for salvation. Oh, there is. Absolutely. Well, then you believe that you, people live sinlessly perfect. Oh, no, absolutely not. You can make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. We just read about it there in verse 14. Why do you think I pray, preach against certain sins? Gluttony, drunkenness, slothfulness, lying, stealing, whatever you want to say. Lust. Why preach against those things if you have a redeemed body right now? You don't. A Christian is capable of all the sins of the lost world. You say, well then, what makes the difference? A Christian that's born again has God as their father, and God will chasten you. God will punish you. That's why when you see these easy believism heretics and they're out there and they're preaching this false gospel and everything else and you see them committing sins and nothing happens to them, you know why? Because in the book of Hebrews, they're called bastards. A bastard is a, is a child that does not know who their father is. Yeah. People have perverted it. Of course, they use it as a profanity type of a word and as a mean thing to say to somebody, certainly. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of bastards out there. Bastard Bible believers. You know, BBBs. <laughs> There's a lot of them. They don't know who their father is. Next, let's go to Romans chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. 
Okay, it says here, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Very true. Keep that in mind. What you do has a direct effect on members of the body of Christ. Verse 8, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. You're God's purchased possession. Oh, but what if I go into the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, and I take the mark? And I see this again, these post-tribbers, these stupid post-tribbers, they'll come out and they'll say, you know, well, the pre-tribulation rapture, there's going to be a lot of Christians that get offended and they're going to fall away. And then what? Then what? Are they going to lose their salvation? Then you're calling God a liar. Our text here says, verse 8, whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. We are His property. Seems kind of funny. These post-tribbers like to call God a liar quite a bit. Who's the father of lies? Who are they really following? The ministers of Satan is who they are. And Satan's ministers appear as the ministers of righteousness. Not some guy in a black robe and black fingernail polish and black lipstick, some goth guy or something, Church of Satan or something like that. Those aren't Satan's ministers. Not at all. Satan's ministers appear as the ministers of righteousness. They're in church buildings. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Continuing, verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Oh, this is very important. Here's where it gets very interesting. He is Lord both of the dead and living. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Keep that in mind. Go to the book of John. Keep your hand there in Romans chapter 14. John chapter 11. Beginning in verse 21. You ready? Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus say unto, saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Brian Moonan's making a big deal about this thing on his little blog thing, and I already talked about that in my one video. He is saying at the last day. The rapture is going to be at the last day. The first resurrection, it ends at the end of the millennial kingdom. That's the last day. That's when the, that's when the rapture happens. I mean, these guys get so confused. They get so messed up because they, are, they refuse to rightly divide the word of truth. And he just, I'm not doing it. Just like Mike Hoggard. I will not be dispensational. Okay, then make a total mess of Scripture. You know, oh, well, I, you know, it has to be at the first resurrection. The first, re Well, then how are we going to rule and reign with Christ for the thousand years, not to mention the marriage supper of the Lamb, not to mention the judgment seat of Christ? How are we going to get all that stuff if we aren't even resurrected until the end of the millennial kingdom? Stupid, stupid, dumb, idiotic, nutty nonsense. I don't like your attitude. Then go watch cartoons, kitty. Okay? Get yourself a lollipop, get back in your crib, and watch some cartoons. Might want to get a little blanket, maybe a pacifier, something to suck on, okay? Kind of calm your nerves a little bit. You're watching the ministry of a man. Maybe you should get a female preacher out there or something like that to talk soothing to you. But let's continue here in John chapter 11, verse 25. Here we go. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't say, I have control of the resurrection. He says, look at the text. He says, 
I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, verse 6. If you don't know this verse by heart, you ought to. John 14, verse 6. Get to it here. Let's turn into it for the sake of people. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. They receive not the love of the truth. Jesus is the life. You see it? Verse 25, John chapter 11. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Huh? Now what are you going to do with that? You say, well, I, I don't, I'm failing to see the, the tie in here. Romans chapter 14, verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. Verse 8. We, uh, whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Ties right in. But now it gets very interesting. Verse 26. Or sorry, verse 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way, and look at this, called Mary her sister secretly. Well, there's no secret rapture. The secret rapture that's totally foreign to Scripture. Keep reading. Sister secretly saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. You say, what is the significance? What book is it that we're reading? The book of John. Keep your hand in the book of John. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, the trump of God, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. You see the tie-in? You see how it works? She arose quickly and came to Jesus. John looks up. He sees a door. He hears his name called and he goes up immediately. Do you see the tie-in? It's right there. Turn to Romans chapter 15. See, what can we get out of that text? What is the main thing that happens at the rapture? The dead and living are united. It's the resurrection. Who is the resurrection? Jesus. You know what Jesus is? Jesus, you ready? Jesus is the rapture. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? What did you just say to me? I said Jesus is the rapture. You have to believe in Him. He is the truth. To go up, you must believe in the truth. We are the Lord's. Whether we are dead or we live, we are the Lord's. What did He say in John chapter 11? He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Right there it is. Amazing. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Do you have a blessed hope today? 
Or are you still looking for the Antichrist? Do you believe that Jesus isn't coming back? There's a good chance you're not going to make it the whole way through the time of Jacob's trouble. Boy, it's going to be hard not taking the mark of the beast. I won't be able to buy and sell. Do you believe that? Or do you have hope? Are you suffering today? Do you have something wrong with you? Some kind of health problems, some kind of financial problems, whatever. And you have that hope that you hold on to. Perhaps today, maybe today I'll get to go and be with the Lord and my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's your blessed hope. And you know what's to bring you? Joy and peace. And you're to abound in that hope. But how could you have that if you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble? It's a problem. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. I'm a post-tribber, okay? Get away from me. I have no time for you. If you will not be admonished, if you keep up with the foolishness of there is no pre-trib rapture, it's all a lie, it was all concocted, get away from me. Okay? I'm going to avoid you. Verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. My ministry exists to encourage people to look for the blessed hope, to understand that Jesus Christ could come back at any time. When the body of Christ is complete, we're leaving. Why? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. My salvation is nearer now than when I first believed. And I look forward to my salvation to my blessed hope when I'm done with this corruptible flesh, when I'm out of this corruptible world. And none of you post-trib heretics is going to take that hope from me and anybody else that watches this ministry. I'm going to show them the scriptures to debunk your satanic system. As long as there is breath within me, I'm going to preach against your heresy. With every fiber of my being, Romans chapter 16, verse 25 through 27. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. What is the mystery? The revelation of the mystery is our salvation through Jesus Christ. You know where it began? It begins at the cross and it ends at the catching away. We're two-thirds saved right now. But when we're called up to be with Jesus Christ, all three parts will be saved. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. Praise God, I'm looking forward to it. Verse... 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Absolutely. We have sure and precious promises. And I want to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, don't let them shake your faith. The heretics are coming out of the woodwork right now. Again, what we are seeing is we're seeing the separation. God is separating the men from the boys, you know, the sons of God from the lost. Don't be Laodicean, like the Laodicean church that's neither hot nor cold or lukewarm. God spews them out of his mouth. God is looking for Christians that are on fire. Christians that say, you're not going to sway me one bit. I know that Jesus Christ is going to take me out of here soon. Why? He is the resurrection. He is our rapture. Rapture means joyous, abounding in joy. Just, oh, rapture. That's Jesus Christ. You say, I reject the rapture. Then you reject Jesus. You reject the truth of God's word. I'm non-dispensational. Then you're rejecting the truth. 
and you better repent. Because let me tell you something, you people out there, you post-tribber, non-dispensationalists, you're headed to hell right now. Why? The Holy Spirit is not showing you your system. Your system revolves around false gospels, false interpretations of Scripture. We are supposed to have unity, thinking the same thing. The Holy Spirit of truth, when He comes, will guide you into all truth. What I have been showing you is the truth, and I will be continuing to show people the truth that there is a rapture, and it is before the time of Jacob's trouble, and the body of Christ goes up, and not one of them is lost. The Lord's not going to get up there and say, Oh, oh, oh. I lost a... I lost 200 Christians. They were part of my body and I lost them. They took the mark. I, <laughs> I should have raptured, raptured them up at, the, at first. I left them there halfway through. They took the mark. Uh, nuts. What kind of weird belief do you people have? You know, you say, why are you so heated with this study? Because, brethren... There has been some massive, massive spiritual attacks that have been happening. Uh, just to give you a little heads up here, if you could please pray for it. Uh, this morning, our main source of heat here in uh, northern Maine, uh, it just went, pfft, not working. You know, it's kind of a problem. I mean, we have some backup heat and stuff like that, but it's just like things, you know, not even a year old. New stove, wood pellet stove, you know, and it's just like, pfft, stops working. I mean, every time I sit down to, to try and do the notes or something like this, something else comes up. I got to fix this thing. I got to do that thing. It's just battle, warfare, warfare, warfare all the time. And I know that some of you out there pray. That's the only reason we're going. Okay, that's the only reason we're still going. All right. Uh, people donate to the ministry. We thank you for that. The prayers, we can feel it. But I'll tell you what, it, things are heating up. They're heating up very, very much. And as a desperate man, I'm saying, please make sure of your salvation. I'm not trying to put people down and say, you're not saved, you're not saved, you're not saved. I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying, hey, if you believe these heresies, you're heading towards false doctrine. You're heading into Matthew 24, 13, that, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's where you're headed. If you're saying Matthew 24 is for Christians, all right, if you're not already there. These post-trib heretics are preaching false gospels. That's why they're believing in this stuff. If you're falling for it, check yourself. Make sure that you're saved. Get out of the system. You better do it. Because if you receive not the love of the truth, if you have pleasure in unrighteousness, which is why these people say, just believe. Just believe. I've been, connected, I've been contacted by these easy believism people, sodomites, perverts, all kinds of people. I'm a Christian. Why would you judge me? I prayed a prayer. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Who are you to judge me? You see, they have pleasure in unrighteousness. They receive not a love of the truth that they might be saved. There is not one thing in this world worthy of you going into this time of Jacob's trouble, missing the catching away of the bride of Christ and going into this time. There's not one thing, not anything, that is worth you going into that time. You say, well, I, I, I believe I'm saved. I, I don't want to keep questioning my salvation. Your salvation is the most important thing in this life. Get it straightened out between you and God. Make sure of your salvation. Well, that's going to be it. Um, I guess we'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would go out and touch the hearts of those that are saved and give them that blessed hope, Lord. Give them that assurance that their salvation is now nearer than when they first believed. That they don't have to worry about losing their salvation, Lord. That they belong to you. That nobody's going to take them out of your hand. Lord, I, I just pray for that because I know that people are being shaken up by these false prophet post-tribbers and easy believers and heretics, Lord. And I just pray that you would help us all to expose them and to tell them to be quiet and not spread their satanic heresies. Help us, Lord, to have the discernment to spot these people. And uh, Lord, if there are some people that we know that are struggling over these issues, I pray that you give us the wisdom and the words to tell them 
how to be truly saved to make sure of their salvation. And I just uh, ask all these things, Lord, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's going to be it. I just, boy, this is a this is a subject that I have been pre-trib, rapture, debate, back and forth. I've been in this thing years before I even went on to YouTube. I'm very familiar with the attacks. I've been through this for a long time. All right? It's disgusting. What these post-tribbers will do, they will lie. The depths that they go to. So, please stand by the Word of God. Please stand by the Blessed Hope. Do not, do not quit. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.